Hi everyone, um, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm honoured to share some thoughts and track the journey of a fabulous new sculpture gracing the Cow Wind in Falkirk as one of the outcomes of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project that Emma mentioned. Um, and that's created uh, a series of replicas that are based on original Roman distance sculptures from the Antonine Wall here in Scotland. So first I thought it might be quite useful to provide some geographical, chronological and cultural context into which these unique monuments sit. And as the name suggests, these are a collection of sculptures that have been recovered from the Antonine Wall, the Roman Empire's most northwestern frontier. Now this massive monument cleaved a route through the central belt of Scotland across the Clyde Porth Isthmus. And there were 17 forts that were constructed along the route of the wall, and these were interspersed with smaller fortlets and watchtowers. Now, to put the wall into its wider geographical and strategic context, it's highlighted here as one section at the top left uh, of your screen of um, a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site now that stretches across several countries entitled Frontiers of the Roman Empire. Now, the region we currently know as Scotland saw several incursions from the Roman Empire dating from the 1st century to the 4th century CE. And of course, the period that we're particularly interested in is around the middle of the 2nd century when the Emperor Antoninus Pius commissioned the construction of his mural barrier around the year 142. So just to mention and, and give you an idea of the forts along the wall, here we have Rough Castle Fort in Falkirk. That's very close to where the sculpture we will be discussing today is located. Um, this happens also to be the best preserved fort along the wall with the best surviving section of the frontier. In this aerial shot, I think hopefully anyway, provides a wider geographical perspective of Rough Castle, as we can see down on the left of your screen. Um, and what we have effectively is a Roman controlled south um, to the left of your screen, as opposed to the wild barbarian non-Romans to the north, um, with the wall cutting a swathe right through the centre of your screen, separating both of these cultural groups. But actually, after a long period when knowledge of the wall had fallen out of memory, its antiquarian rediscovery prompted General William Roy to record its surviving features and forts in great detail um, in his military map of Scotland, dating to 1793. So he has provided us with a really interesting and important historical documentation and record of the surviving remains of the forts and the wall uh, in the late 18th century, to the extent that we even have down on the bottom, we can see profiles as in sideways um, view of the, the terrain associated with those forts. And there's been enormous interest in the Antonine Wall uh, since antiquarian times, with the Glasgow Archaeological Society in particular undertaking the most prolific and intensive investigations along the wall. Um, really maintaining that Rough Castle Fort connection. Here we have members of the society um, at Rough Castle Fort in the 19th century. Um, the astute amongst you might notice that actually on the left we have a woman as part of the group, which is fairly unusual of the day, and also some children, which is really nice to see um, some young people interested in their heritage at the time. Now, the Antonine Wall differs markedly from its predecessor and neighbour to the south, Hadrian's Wall, that some of you are doubtless very familiar with. I say that because, unlike Hadrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall was not constructed of stone, um, but of large turf slabs that were laid atop of each other, um, stretching up to height of three or possibly up to four metres high, and that's roughly at least 20 turfs deep. And we can see some of these turfs in the profile in a section if you like of the wall yeah and these are these are the turfs 
and we can see the stratigraphy of them placed atop each other. Now we speak about the wall, but this wall was actually only one feature of um, many elements that actually include the turf rampart, which is what we refer to as the wall, which sat on top of a wall, a stone base, reaching up to a height of, as I say, approximately three to four metres. But then immediately to the north of that, we have a berm. And the berm is a platform that separated the wall from a five metre V cut, cut ditch immediately to the north of it. And that's effectively known as an ankle breaker ditch, very common to Roman ditches, which is, as you can see on the right here in the illustration, very, very sharp V at the bottom of this feature. Now, immediately to the north of that is the upcast mound, which consisted of the spoil from the ditch. Now, one feature that is rarely discussed, um, but actually I think should be considered as an equally essential part uh, of the infrastructure of the wall is the military way to the south uh, of the rampart itself. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, but I think I just wanted to sort of take all of these elements together um, to form actually a series, a sequence, if you like, of features that um, offer defensive aspects and elements against any incursions from northern barbarians, as Roman writers would have called the local peoples. Um, I guess we could say it's a bit like a modern day Ironman obstacle course that, um, you know, some people, not myself, but some people find uh, of interest. Um, I think this image quite nicely shows how challenging it might have been to try and get over the top of that wall in the muddy terrain that would have been um, common to it on the second century. But just to give you a little bit more detail on the construction phases of the wall, we have on the left a representation of the wall under construction um, by the Roman legions. And we can see the, the ditch being placed here. Um, at the bottom here um, and the the berm along with some lilia which are uh, oblong shaped features that were cut into the ground and we find these at Rough Castle and um, they would have had very sharp wooden spikes embedded into them as another defensive feature that would have been an obstacle to any anyone who thought of incursion uh, from the north. And then the wall itself, we probably would have had some sharpened branches again coming out of that, along with a platform at the top with the bastion. Um, and we can see on the right a uh, reconstruction of how a gateway would have looked. So again, just to give you a better idea of how the wall base itself was constructed, here we have a, a drone footage of uh, the foundations at Bear's Den Fort. I think it very nicely captures the kind of scale um, of that base of stone here. Uh, four metre wide, we see that um, a drainage ditch through the centre of that there, because we would have needed um, that stone base to hold what was a very, very heavy um, rampart wall of heavy turfs on top of it. So it needed to have a very firm base at the bottom, um, and I think that shows very nicely here with this footage. So getting back to our main topic of discussion today, um, the distant sculptures, here's a map of their fine spots from the vicinity of the wall. Now, the Falkirk area is not only important for having the best surviving port and sections of the wall, but it's also where the biggest and most highly decorated distance sculpture was recovered from, and that was from Bridge Ness near the eastern terminus of the wall, shown here as number one. I mentioned the Bridge Nest sculpture a moment ago, and here it is in its full glory. Um, it, I think it really nicely demonstrates the format that the newly commissioned sculpture that we're going to talk about today takes. Um, it has a central inscription panel flanked on either side by iconography, um, and sometimes we have decorative pelta, which are these shield-like objects on the side. Now, the inscriptions are in formulaic abbreviated Latin, 
um, from the Bridgeness sculpture. We can see the pattern of those abbreviated words uh, and the translation here. So very briefly, um, just to, to, to kind of articulate what those letters are in Latin. Uh, imp says Taito, Elio, Hedri, Antonino, Og, Pio, PP, Leg, to Og, Per, MP, and then lots of letters, uh, which are actually numbers, Roman numerals. Um, and that translates in English of today is uh, for the Emperor Caesar, Titus, Elias, Hadrianus, Antoninus, Augustus Pius, to give him his full title. Father of his country, the Second Augustus Legion built this over a distance of 4,652 units of measure. So these sculptures served several purposes. Okay, they're there as dedications primarily for the emperor, showing legionary loyalty. They document the legions, that is the second, the sixth and the twentieth legions who constructed the wall. And we know that through these inscriptions. They also document the length of the frontier um, that each of the legions built, hence their nomenclature. But on top of that, they are also, um, they provide very graphic scenes of life on the frontier. And that ranges from religious practice, as we see on the right, we have some legions undertaking some um, sacrificial offerings to one of their gods. We have also representations of deities as well as military activities. Um, on the left, for example, we can see what is a very brutal scene of battle on the Bridge Nest sculpture. Now, this is a mid-battle scene where a Roman cavalryman is riding down and decapitating naked northern warriors in the heat of battle. Um, the Somerson Farm example, um, which is also very similar in format to the Bridgeness sculpture. Um, but it differs in content because the Somerson Farm, unlike the Bridgeness sculpture, um, here we have a post-battle scene with the northers, northerners now captured. They are bound, they're still naked. They are bound though with their hands tied behind their back. And here the cavalryman is guarding them rather than riding them down in battle. But he's also receiving honours from the Roman goddess Victory, probably celebrating his victory over these people. But these also served as a propaganda object because they were demonstrating very graphically the, the might and power and glory of Rome to various audiences, including Roman soldiers, members of the community that were following the Roman army as well, and also to local people. So anyone who was interacting with them, but thereby what they were doing is they were able to strengthen legionary loyalty and also strike fear into the heart of the locals. So these are really very powerful and iconic objects that are actually unique in the Empire's frontiers. Now, it may surprise you to know that none of these objects were found in their original context along the wall. Um, many were in fact found in the immediate vicinity, south of the barrier, uh, but actually others were built into boundary walls or gateways of nearby stately homes. One even made it as far north as Concardenshire, where it was embedded into the Great Hall of the Notter Castle off the northeast coast of Scotland um, by the Earl's Marshal. But that's a different story and we don't have time to cover that today. The conventional wisdom is adamant that the distance sculptures record the distance of the wall, uh, as in the rampart um, construction. But you remember I mentioned a moment ago that uh, actually the infrastructure of the wall uh, was consisted of many, uh, several different elements, including the military way. Now, the military way is a really critical feature of the frontier for transporting troops and supplies. And local people may even have used this road as well. I mean, why wouldn't they uh, to navigate a region which would otherwise be quite challenging to uh, navigate? But it is a critical feature of the frontier because it was used for transporting troops and supplies, as I say, and, you know, uh, moving people from one place to another. Um, so I'm going to suggest, admittedly quite controversially, that um, actually only two of the distance sculptures explicitly make mention of the wall's construction. 
So in fact, I'm going to suggest that they may more logically have been placed along the military way, a bit like um, modern road markers that we are all nowadays accustomed to see. I stole this from a presentation by Dutch colleagues on a completely different topic recently, but I think it very nicely makes my point. If we can imagine um, the Somerset Farm uh, sculpture here, for example, you know, and, and it helps us to understand that actually, if you're walking along a military way, you know, this this sculpture tells you quite graphically and uh, clearly that the stretch of walk uh, of military way you're about to walk along um, was constructed along with the rest of the frontier with particular legions. And some of them have been found together, so it, it's quite possible they would have backed onto each other. So you could see that these stretches were, were constructed by uh, different legions, um, depending on either direction you were coming from. So having gone over all that background, I think we can potentially now return to the replica sculpture at the Cow Wind. The Antonine Wall, as Emma mentioned earlier, runs right through five council areas uh, and part of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project was to replicate distance sculptures from these areas. And the intention for that was to install them into locations close to their place of discovery. Um, sadly, we don't have time to cover all of those five today, but you'll have to join us for the rest of the talks this week to do that. Um, but since the Bridge Nest sculpture, which is closest to Falkirk, um, has already been replicated. Um, it's been installed close to its place of discovery at Bowness. We can see that represented here. Um, actually, local communities decided that they wanted a brand new version to be carved, which would emulate but make very significant changes to uh, the original Roman content. So just to sort of think about this as a staged process, really, um, Stage one of that uh, process was after consultation with the local people, um, Scottish Borders based sculptors Josephine Crossland and Luke Batchelor, who we can see here, uh, were commissioned to produce the new artwork by April 2020. Now their design emulates that three panel style that we saw a moment ago with that central inscription flanked by iconographic uh, imagery. But these images explore a much wider perspective in the story of the Roman occupation of Scotland. And that's because a stated requirement of the community was they wanted to see depictions of local protagonists fighting back rather than as naked subservient captives of the empire. And so this sculpture really closely emulates certain features of the originals, but they have very distinctive differences. So on the one hand, the, the text, as you can see here, is inscribed in English, not that familiar prescripted abbreviated Latin that characterises the original examples. And this is to ensure that the message is accessible to contemporary audiences. And the inscription actually commemorates the rediscovering the Antonine Wall project and the 21st century legion of volunteers who played a pivotal role in its delivery. The only Roman numerals that we see here inscribed are MMXX for 2020, denoting the year of its production, rather than the measured distances that were um, inscribed into the originals. And also flipping the script, um, that narrative that we're familiar with here in the panels on the left, we're seeing a local rider on a horse-drawn carriage riding down a fallen Roman soldier rather than the other way around. And he's accompanied by um, into battle by this haunting drone of the Desperate Carnix, which is a, a very well-known Iron Age brass instrument in a uh, zoomorphic form. Um, the original of it is in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. But there was also a desire by the local people to express, uh, explore sorry, that less antagonistic character of interaction with the Romans so that um, this ferocious battle scene on the left is juxtaposed on the right with a more settled scene of an indigenous couple in the foreground with an iconic dry stone broch tower in the background. In front of them are Romans holding a ceramic jar in reference to a locally found Falkirk coin hoard um, of Roman stone, uh, Roman coinage. And also they're wearing um, the earliest known tartan. So the man 
um, as part of that couple on the right and also the rider on the left are both wearing that tartan. And so these are clear references to the relevant local finds um, with a Roman affiliation. Um, and that alters the whole dynamic, I think, of the iconography and it creates these local connections uh, and a different way of looking at uh, these sculptures. Cop crag sandstone was quarried from Burness in Northumberland and that was what we uh, what had been used for the sculpture and that's from a close very source to the modern Scottish border. It has characteristics very close to the sandstone used for the original sculptures and that stone is used extensively across Scotland but it's also an excellent raw material for carving because of its very fine grain um, and also its unique colouring and markings and it provides a very crisp edge that weathers very well uh, and articulates lettering and iconography beautifully. So that next stage, once the stone has been quarried, was to draw out the features to, to scale so that they could be accurately placed onto the replica stone. Now the original inscriptions were quite poorly spaced and cramped at line ed ends on some of them and that's a situation the artists have overcome by introducing ligatures that enabled them to connect and merge some of the letters and create more character to the piece by employing what is a very typical Roman technique. Hand tools were also used for the sculpture which although inevitably much slower also permitted um, hand and eye coordination to discover the forms in a much more organic and natural way. And that allowed for the production of an effect that was much more aligned to original Roman sculptures. And attempts not to overwork the piece also left some quite crude tool marks. And that proved actually quite challenging to the, to the artist because modern day aesthetics tend to be requiring of a more precise and refined finish. So it kind of flies against the natural instincts of highly skilled artisans to ask them not to refine their surface too much in order to emulate Roman techniques. So here is the finished product. Um, it's a contemporary and very provocative piece of art in its own right. It combines iconography and inscribed text that actually subvert the propaganda permeating the original sculptures. The depicted scenes are conflicting with the originals as a means of eliciting an emotional response in the viewer, and it invites them to consider different dynamics and new dimensions in the contradictory perspectives of local Iron Age peoples who had obviously a very different experience of events from Roman military personnel that typically frames the narratives of these iconic objects. And for example, there's also a really subtle natural red colour woven through this stone that lends itself really perfectly to the subject matter because it emulates red pigments that I've been able to determine was once applied to the originals. And that creates a, a dynamic and visually impactful effect of blood seeping through the surface and permeating the sandstone really to imbue it with a sense of realism. And that's, I think, particularly the case in the bottom left of this scene where we have the, uh, the Roman soldier who's fallen in the heat of battle. And so here is the finished sculpture now installed into a beautiful setting on the cow wind uh, close to Falkirk Town Centre, which is very easily accessible. And local communities are encouraged to engage with their new artwork and create their own connections with it uh, through stories yet to be told. And some of those stories are very likely to deviate quite significantly from the narratives that have been imposed through traditional museums displays. Critically, they're not burdened by the restrictions that are necessarily in place in the museum setting, such as lighting, access times, no touching rules, guided content and interpretations, internet access required for digital content, for example. And lighting over the course of the day and during different seasons will also transform the way that we experience um, this sculpture and the stone's patina or its surface is going to change over time as well. And so people are actually encouraged here to have a tactile, emotional and fully immersive experience and 
forge new connections and make new places with their sculpture. And I hope in the future um, I'd like to meet some of you as you engage with the sculpture and hopefully the other ones along the uh, along the Antonine Wall, the new replicas. Um, I'm hoping to undertake some new research on their contemporary performance and reception in the present day. So next time you're wandering around your stately home or any stately home, an old church or an old wall, you know, look carefully at it and check there isn't a Roman distance sculpture embedded into it that you'd never seen before. You know, and if there is, obviously give me a call. The one other dimension I wanted to just very briefly cover and ask you to think about when you're contemplating these things is, you know, how might it have looked if there had been colour applied to it? This is a digital reconstruction of one iconic scene from the bridge nest sculpture. And we can see this Roman cabinet and, and I think we experience it in a very different way. It, it, it's brought to life in a more um, realistic and authentic way. And we can see it for what it is in, in, insofar as it is a very brutal scene of battle. And we can imagine that more clearly because we see the colour, we, we, you know, the people in it are brought to life, most particularly the cabinet man himself um, and all the different shades of red. That we see here, even drips of red on the on the um, on the point of his spear, coming from these northern warriors that he's running down. In particular, we can be struck by the the, the flowing blood of this um, decapitated northern warrior at the bottom. So it brings the whole scene to life and gives it a completely di a different dynamic. I think. So I hope you feel encouraged to travel to Falkirk um, and experience the sculpture firsthand. And you can do that by following the directions in this really helpfully uh, produced leaflet that the, the, the project, the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project has put together for you. Um, that includes a map that pinpoints the location of the new sculpture at the Cowind. And also some information on how you can travel to visit that sculpture uh, using different methods of transportation. So I thank you again for joining me today and uh, I welcome any of your questions or comments.